Fantasy-animation.org is a website with a difference. It is not for profit and it's run entirely by academics and professional animators. And this means that whether you are reading our latest blog or accessing our latest podcast, thanks for downloading by the way, you can be sure that you are getting the most up-to-date and informed commentary on the colliding worlds of fantasy storytelling and the medium of animation. Whether you are a budding animator yourself, a student of fantasy or animation, or just someone who wants to learn more about the history and theory behind these overlapping media, mediums and genres, why not find out more at fantasy-animation.org or subscribe to our various social media threads on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Reddit, at Fananim Research, F-A-N-A-N-I-M Research. While you're at it, subscribe to the podcast, give us a star rating, and better yet, a quick written review as well. It all helps to make the visibility of our project even stronger and attract more like-minded people like yourself to our growing network of fans. For now, do enjoy the show. Hi again, listeners, and welcome to the Fantasy Animation Podcast. I am, as always, Alex Sargent. And I am Chris Holliday. And today we're talking about The Land Before Time, a film that uh, was a deep part of my childhood, so I had quite a Proustian experience re-watching the film in, ahead of this podcast. Um, as a fantasy uh, historian and, and theorist, it, it conjured up thoughts about um, world building, as always, the role of dinosaurs in the popular and imagination, um, as well as kind of thematic things about kind of... Um, fantasy as metaphor, uh, fantasy as Christian allegory, as as racial allegory, um, and as well as uh, Don Bluth, who I think is a really important animator and fabulous in the history of sort of American film. And, and I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk about him uh, for that reason. Chris, anything interesting with animation to talk about this week? Yes, well, I'll pick up uh, the, the Don Blue thread um, because it's somebody that I've kind of wanted to, to do. And I know that we've, I think we've talked, you know, outside of the podcast about we should really do something connected to, to Bluth as this really important figure, certainly within the, the, the trajectory of 1980s animation. So I've got a few notes on kind of the... the the role of Bluth within the context of the Disney Renaissance, but also stuff on narrative structure, like the narrative structure of, of animation and what does it mean? Not all animation has narrative. Um, and there's something quite interesting, I think, about the cycles of, of repetition and the um, idea of directional movement that really propels something like The Land Before Time, as well as stuff on why are animators so frequently drawn to the to the image of dinosaurs. So, yeah, lots lots to say. and I, And I know our guest is going to be able to say them. Well, and our guest, who I'm delighted to introduce now, and I'll tell you what, these are some words that I've practised. Uh, Mark uh, Witten is a British vertebrate paleontologist, author and paleo artist based at the University of Portsmouth. He's worked with museums and universities around the world, as well as being a designer on various films, including consultancy work on the Walk with, Walking with Dinosaurs franchise, as well as BBC's Planet Dinosaur. So, Mark, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the podcast. Uh, morning, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, we're doing well, Mark. Uh, thanks for coming on the show today. And uh, Land Before Time, it's a, it's a movie I'm really excited to talk to you about. Uh, let's start with dinosaurs, though. Um, how did you become a paleo artist? How does one become a paleo artist? And why are you so interested in depicting dinosaurs in art as well as in science? So, I mean, for me, this goes just right back to being uh, being a child and having that, that same childhood and dress in dinosaurs that everyone does. Um, and essentially just never growing out of it. Um, and along along with that interest, as, as you know, lots of kids, I, I was always I was always drawing pictures, and um, you know, over time, it just came to be that dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals just became the the topics I was drawing more than anything else. And um, I never actually set out to be a an artist, but um, uh, so my university career was through the sciences. So I got my, got my degree and my PhD in in paleontology, is in the, the study of fossil life. The scientific study of fossil life, um, but uh, yeah, you know, all the time I kept drawing. I kept, I kept. Um, eventually, I moved into digital painting, and um, you know, eventually, I, I started getting more attention for that side of my 
profession than for my science. And so I still do the science, but I'd say primarily now I'm more on the artistic side of things. It's interesting because you say that that childhood fascination with dinosaurs, which I'm sure a lot of listeners will relate to. Um, we're going to start with the with this week's impossible question, I think, and it's going to be for you, unfortunately, Mark, this week. Dinosaurs seem to be a recurring, not only feature of childhood imagination, lots of kids get interested in dinosaurs, um, but of, you know, both um, fantasists and animators. It's a thing we've talked about on the podcast before. It's a thing often again and again and again, Hollywood will return to, whether it be, you know, right back in the 20s or something like The Lost World, a pioneering stop motion effect, uh, something like this, which is a sort of, um, you know, studio vehicle for the Don Bluth um, production, the fledgling Don Bluth productions, right through to something like Jurassic Park with the invention of CGI. Do you have any explanation for why you think dinosaurs are sort of this recurrent cultural, you know, creatures of fascination and, and of the imaginary? Yeah, so this is an excellent question, and it's something that we discuss in an academic sense as well. You know, why why are we so interested in dinosaurs? I mean, you can go right the way back into the 19th century. So dinosaurs are first discovered in the 1820s and the 1830s. And by the 1850s, we're just getting a sense of how how marketable they are. And so you can go to, uh, if you go up to southern London, you've gone... The, uh, to the Crystal Palace Park, and there's life-size models of what, was, what people thought dinosaurs looked like at that time. And um, these were part of the big Crystal Palace um, uh, exhibition that was put on in, in the park in the 1850s. And it's interesting that among all of the other spectacular events and um, exhibits they had for, for the Crystal Palace Park, the dinosaurs were, they were really pushed as, you know, Mark, uh, as, as for, for merchandising and for marketing above everything else. And so this is just something that's, that's really always been there. There's something about these large, somewhat unusual, charismatic fossil animals that we just really find appealing. And um, yeah, what is that X factor? Why do we keep going back to them? And, and some part of this is is probably because if you really get into the history of, of this, um, there is kind of a politics in, in science and in, in paleontology. And we know that in the late 19th century, American museums in particular, so America has the first really cool, really giant dinosaurs found anywhere on the planet. All the stuff that starts dinosaur science in Europe is a bit scrappy. So none of the specimens are particularly complete or anything like that. America starts finding things like the big brontosauruses and the stegosauruses and those kind of guys. And, um, and so they're a great way for America to push its museums and its paleontological science into the forefront of, uh, you know, of, of, of pop culture, you know, to say that this is, that we're putting our big stamp on this with our amazing dinosaurs. And from that point, dinosaurs are just there. You know, they are very, very popular animals. They start to dominate all the textbooks. They start to dominate popular books on science. And I think, you know, around that point, you start getting, you know, the, the invention of cinema. So you've already mentioned the 1925 Lost World. And it's picking up on that. You know, dinosaurs are uh, a ready-made popular topic for the public by the time that cinema is invented. And I think, you know, we get when we get to the, the 20th century and we get the development of, of film, we go from, you know, sort of live action film into dedicated animated films. Um, you know, dinosaurs are just there waiting to be used for this topic because there's already so much public interest in them. Well, I would, I'm mean, supposed to just, just, uh, just jump in on that, the sort of cultural fascination or the growing and emergent cultural fascination with, with dinosaurs and how that might map onto the interests of, of early animators. I'm, I mean, we've talked on the on the podcast before about these sorts of keynote films and why it is that... Um, it makes perfect sense that Jurassic Park would, or sort of, that CGI would be used within the context of, of something like dinosaurs, given the relationship between CGI and animation as a technology of illusion and, and, and bringing life to these objects and, and, and movements to, to things never before seen. Um, recalling a language of the 1890s, you know, early, early 20th century where where we have films like Gertie the Dinosaur, where we are seeing these characters move for the very first time. And, and, and part of the pleasure of the emergent medium is kind of connecting that up to to dinosaurs and using dinosaurs as, as this touchstone, as you say, but also a, a vehicle to play with to play with a kind of anthropomorphic registers. And, and, you know, I think the trend, we had a recent blog post on the, on the website um, from Ross Garner about that actually name checks the land before time and, and kind of connects up history of the history of the representation of dinosaurs in animation with ideas of kind of cuteness and, and, and actually how, how animation did a lot 
to kind of solidify what we think dinosaurs look like, how they move. I Yeah, we, we were talking just before we came on air, you know, why is it that, that dinosaurs are this recurrent um, point of, of interest and fascination for, for animators across the, the history of the medium? So it's really interesting that dinosaurs kind of come to the fore at a particular time and, and start to emerge within kind of out there in the world. And then animation really picks, picks that fascination up and, and runs with it and establishes a certain, yeah, aesthetic, maybe formal template i mean you were mentioning before we came in you teach through or animated anatomy through dinosaurs or what's that relationship like because i think that that speaks to some of the ways that animators are using dinosaurs in the same way yeah so i think the uh the 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 wonderful thing about dinosaurs and other extinct animals is that they are they're 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 unusual uh, anatomically unusual but also familiar at the same time so if you're trying to teach students anatomy um, you can go, well, look, here is a living reptile or a bird, and then say, let's take some of that and map that onto this extinct relative of these animals. And, and you can really start to understand how things go together when you, when you have a slightly unusual version of a living animal. Yeah, yeah. And you start going, well, you know, it's the same muscles that are going over this thing. You've just got to put them into a different shape. And so it's a terrific way of introducing students to you know, how how things go together, how joints work, how soft tissues relate to each other, you know, how, um, you know, how things like the size and mass influence uh, what we call functional morphology, you know, where you're, where you're talking about the, the relationship between uh, anatomical shape and form and its, and its biological function. And so there's all sorts of stuff that you can introduce to students through, through dinosaurs. And, and because, and maybe this ties into something as to, you know, why they're popular animation subjects in general, they're sort of already pre-designed, you know, they come out of the ground in fossil form. And so there, there's something where you can focus more on, on rebuilding them rather than imagining what they look like entirely from scratch. And so it, that maybe helps us get to something that's a little bit more, I, I'm looking for the word here, something that's a bit more sort of realistic, a bit more sort of, you know, compelling to look at than something that's purely imagined where we can't really say what the constraints are but with a dinosaur we can look at something and eyeball it animate it and go that looks right that looks like what i'd expect a real animal of that size and shape and proportion to 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 look like and how it might work Mm. i think that ties into some stuff we've talked on the podcast about fantasy and that you know we, we often think of fantasy as this purely imaginative act but you know most theorists of fantasy will actually say usually fantasy as a mode of writing as a mode of spectacle as a, any kind of kind of artistic mode of address is really a process of um, either addition or subtraction from reality it's either about taking an element of reality and applying it to a new setting or making it more intensified you know making in you know in the case of things like dragons making lizards bigger and able to fly but they're still based on some sort of you know, creature on the earth, um, or or subtracting and 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 reducing and simplifying, and and I think maybe a dinosaur is a fun animal to play with in that respect as well, right? It's it's an animal that contains elements that we recognise still on this earth, but obviously what we might think of as kind of fabulous elements in their size, in their kind of um, huge armour, in their yeah, uh, and I think this film plays with both that, but also um, how we can imagine dinosaurs relating to one another. And I was interesting on how much the film tried to say something about that as well. It, not only does it imagine dinosaurs as a species, but it imagines dinosaurs as a kind of community and what a community of dinosaurs um, would look like. And that's, that's a kind of interesting aspect of this film um, as well. I um I think maybe to get onto the movie, and I think this is a question for Chris really to take rather than me. Uh, Chris, yeah. the film begins with um, a, a a caption that says uh, a Lucas Spielberg presentation of a Don Bluth film. Talk to us about that, please. Yeah, I knew that because that is also my first my first note. A Lucas Spielberg. Uh, presentation um yes so don bluth as i mentioned in the introduction is is a figure that we'd sort of uh, thought about when we planned these podcasts and somebody who's i think cropped up in our own in our own work perhaps in in different ways so um bluth himself is a is a or was a particularly popular animator in the 1980s and is very much connected with the sort of lead up to what we would know as the as the disney renaissance uh bluth himself was an ex-disney animator i mean he worked as, I think as far back as, as Sleeping Beauty as an assistant animator and then progressively his name appears at various moments throughout Walt Disney's animated history, uh, Robin Hood, Adventures of Winnie the Pooh and then The Rescuers. 
and then after the rescuers he sort of moves away from the from the disney studio he does a little bit of work on on fox and the hound but after that which is early 80s i think 80 81 something like that um he then moves to kind of make his own his own films in a tie-in with with Spielberg and Lucas, and it was the success of of Land Before Time, and, and I think a couple of his, his other his other films um, that kind of are really important to framing the context and the reemergence in the sort of post Walt Disney era after Walt's death um, in the in the kind of sixties seventies. This sort of reemergence of animation in the period that we know as the Disney Renaissance. So um, some really important films at this particular moment: Secret uh, of Nim, American Tale in 1986 this film the land before time in 88 which i'd never seen before so it was great to to watch and decided to just stop at this one rather than watch the dozen subsequent movies uh and then all all dogs go to heaven from 1989 so there's this really interesting run of three films american tale land before time and all dogs go to heaven um that was released in 89 that really I think is you could argue that the Disney Renaissance starts with those films in a strange way. It doesn't start with The Little Mermaid and the success of of, of sort of post eighty nine Disney animation. It it can be attributed to a figure like like Don Bluth. So that's the animation context set up. We've also got the fact that this is the late eighties. This is the yes. era of, of high fantasy. Lucas and Spielberg are bringing back everyone's fifties and forties and thirties childhood to life, which means you know making Star Wars. It means making films like Willow, and it means reinventing animation. Um, and it also means, of course, dinosaurs. So, Mark, what's the context in terms of? I don't know. Ha- have dinosaur movies been popular at this point? Has there been a kind of dull moment? What What does this film? do in terms of the history of dinosaurs on screen yeah so the the 80s is not what you'd consider a you know particularly classic period for dinosaur films i wouldn't say um i mean if you think about the the real high points of of dinosaur movie history you've got things like ray harryhausen working Mm. in the late 60s um you've got fantasia is is one of these films that people talk about in particularly high regard just because of that rite of spring sequence um but yeah, you know, up until then, you, you don't really have a huge amount of stuff. I mean, dinosaurs are appearing as sort of monsters in in essentially B films. You know, they're sort of like the cave girl films, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, Land Before Time is a little bit unusual for for where it fits into that chronology. Mm. Of course, you, you can sort of see it, particularly with the Spielberg tie. You can see it as a forerunner to a film comes out five years later that none of us have heard of called Jurassic Park. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, yeah, and it's quite interesting to compare these films because they're produced so close together. Um, and yet, in many regards, from a, from a paleontological perspective, they are very different beasts. Uh, you know, with Jurassic Park, the science was pretty pretty cutting edge. You know, it was essentially based on the last 10, 20 years of paleontological science, whereas Land Before Time is just this big melting pot of mm-hmm. all sorts of influences of from the 20th century. So there's like this... There's really about 50 years or more of science represented in Land Before Time. So in that respect, it's a very interesting film to look at. And it's, you know, from a you know, scientific perspective, it's just sort of a, it's a real mess. It's all over the place. They don't really know what their influences are. It's just all put, put in. And, and I think this idea of it being a, a fantasy um, is, you know, is a big part of that. It's sort of cherry picking bits of science that suited the narrative and the, the tone of the film rather than letting... The, the most up-to-date contemporary science de- decide what the tone of the film would be. So could you just unpack a bit of that for us? What, what, what are the kind of broad, you know, scientific tropes it's, it's taking from in the movie? Yeah. So I think that we, we could talk about this for, for ages. So I'll try and, I'll try and be brief. Um, okay. So let, let's start with the, the most obvious thing, which is the appearance of the characters. Um, so the, the, just a little bit of context here in the late uh, late 20th century, but from about sort of the late 60s into the 1970s onwards, dinosaur um, dinosaur science undergoes a, a big shot in the arm. It's a sort of a uh, what we call the dinosaur renaissance. So suddenly, people are really interested in dinosaurs, <laughs> and they are changing much about what we what we thought we knew about their life appearance, about their physiology. Um, essentially, the, the 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 modern dinosaur is invented in the late 20th century. And so this is when, you know, if we think about classic dinosaur depictions uh, where they're kind of standing upright like kangaroos, it's at this point where they start to go be tilted forward and they're walking with horizontal backs. You know, if you think about uh, a classic Ray Harryhausen uh, theropod dinosaur, one of his predatory dinosaurs, I should say, uh, from something like 1 million years BC, they're walking around upright. And then think about that, 
that Jurassic Park Tyrannosaurus with its horizontal back. Um, that's essentially the difference you're looking at. And in Land Before Time, you've got animals that are walking around with that sort of more modern horizontal back. And yet at the same time, they're doing stuff that people were saying dinosaurs were doing in the early 20th century. So the big long neck dinosaurs, for instance, are walking around like terrestrial animals, as we thought they were in the late 20th century. And yet at other times we see them in swamps, which is where we put them when we thought they couldn't support their weight on land and that they were just you know, essentially these gigantic but kind of slightly rubbish animals that couldn't really, <laughs> they couldn't eat any tough, uh, tough vegetation. So they couldn't, couldn't support their weight without, without some support from water. Um, so yeah, it, it's, all, it's all over the map. Things like the, um, the big predatory dinosaur in Land Before Time, which they call the sharp tooth, which is clearly based on Tyrannosaurus. That's, uh, that's an animal that can't decide what decade it's in because it's walking around sometimes with its back slightly upright, but its tail is never dragging on the floor. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's really you know it's it's a mixed bag of of um, different scientific ideas from all these different periods in the 20th century, um, and 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 to think of the the landscape is also something I really picked up on uh, rewatching this. So the landscape is is slightly fantastical in that a lot of the rock formations, a lot of the geology in it, it's it's sort of super exaggerated and it's got this kind of gnarly, twisted look to everything. Uh, so it's got a fantastical element to it, but. At the same time, it also picks up on this, uh, by this point, rather old idea of dinosaur extinction being driven by this, uh, there's this like sort of a dying of the landscape that they live in. So there's lots of different ideas about why dinosaurs went extinct uh, running up to the 1980s. But one of the most popular ones is that there was either intense global heating, intense global cooling, but the bottom line is that the environment died on them and they had nothing to eat. And so, you know, that the idea of them, of, of this community of dinosaurs and land before time having to get to the Great Valley is, um, it kind of feels like it's, it's picking up on that, you know, at, at this point, rather old idea of, of, of the land leaving the dinosaurs behind and leaving them with, with nowhere to live, in essence. Um, and it, just to put a bit more context into this, we should say that, again, that there was a more modern um, idea of the the meteorite impact uh, ending the the era of the dinosaurs. This was published in 1980, so that idea was on the table, but, and it was already probably the best supported idea at this point. Um, and yet, the filmmakers decided to go with this much older concept. I mean, they're never really clear on exactly why the landscape is dying in the land before time. So I could be reading too much into this here, but it, it does seem that they're playing on this this older trope, um, which again, is it, played out in things like The Rite of Spring. Uh, and it's sort of echoed in Harryhausen's dinosaur films where the landscapes in all of those are very bleak. Um, in The Rite of Spring, we see dinosaurs going under this, this march to extinction. We see them literally, you know, flopping down from the intense sun that they're in. In Harry Housen's films, where they they film the Mediterranean islands, I think, on, on volcanic islands where there's no vegetation, so it all looks very barren and, and, and bleak. Um, so the Land Before Time seems to be picking up on on that older idea, and as I say, instead of using a more modern one. So it's it's just all over the map. It's just really choosing whatever whatever would best suit the story and best suit the tone of the film, rather than the, the you know the most up to date science. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because I. I was watching all of this and, and you know, I, I mean, the film's called The Land Before Time, but as we all know, films uh, are always set in the time that they're set in, as in when they're made, um, and particularly films that are set in the past. And I couldn't quite, um, I, I couldn't quite appreciate watching it as a child how, how 1980s this is in the sense that there's a kind of hodgepodge of different kind of, I don't know, social and political things that are going on in American society that I think might start to account for some of those choices. And that this this narrative of, of Littlefoot having to get to the Great Valley um, and kind of assembling what's essentially a sort of fellowship of the ring of different dinosaurs <laughs> to get there, one kind of goes to kind of, you know, high fantasy narratives of the 1970s, 80s, and obviously like 60s, 50s in literature. Uh, two is a kind of, you know, very Christian um, allegory. It's, it's you know, this great valley where you will find peace and joy and ever and be reunited with your loved ones. You know, there's, there's, there's a real kind of palatable Christian element to it, which is helped by the fact that we have, you know, the death of um, Littlefoot's mother in the first kind of, you know, 
uh, act of the movie. And then she kind of operates as this angelic presence throughout the movie that constantly whispers into Littlefoot's ear to kind of keep him going on the right direction. He follows a star, um, the tree star, this kind of, you know, um, this this uh, emblem um, that's kind of part, you know, a star from biblical narrative and part the ring from Lord of the Rings. Um, and you've got this kind of racial allegory, which is that these dinosaurs have to kind of get on together when they've been taught um, a certain kind of social structure where different species don't talk to each other. And and all of that is creating this kind of world of the dinosaurs that actually f- more resembles 1980s America than it does anything prehistoric. And I think it brings together what, what you were saying, Mark, in regards to that sort of hodgepodge of different different types of dinosaurs. And you mentioned kind of the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex not, not knowing where it's placed not knowing what decade it's in and and i mean let's not forget for for an animators one of the things that is particularly interesting for and about dinosaurs is that they are the kind of creative scope that they provide animators to really play with issues of of character and and movement and one of the things that struck me about this was that it was very character centered you know it's emphasis on in its journey narrative which hopefully we'll get to, to kind of talk about the emphasis on action, character, behavior, um, movement, anthropomorphism, but also then collaboration and, and labor. All of that is anchored to this to this journey narrative. And and in regards to that hodgepodge collection of dinosaurs that you could read politically, yeah, I I my I have a few notes on the one of the quotes in the film. We all keep to our own kinds, and that sort of tension in difference. But equally, what struck me was the way that these characters are described and what that says about the importance of seeing these dinosaurs as as children um because the description shark tooth long necks three horn these are all quote unquote childish ways of discussing certain kinds of dinosaurs based on predominant physical characteristics and as alex said you know you can read that absolutely politically you can read it as an allegory of, of racial difference. I was thinking about the late, late 1980s and biracial buddy movies, as I often am on this podcast, and, and how that maps onto um, tensions in difference in, in this film. But equally, if we think about Windsor McKay back in the sort of 1910s, ascribing Gertie the dinosaur this sort of sweet innocence, uh, but r- positioning or drawing him as a almost as a child and the and the dinosaur is transformed into a pet um, and that's I think what I mean about animators crafting a particular template from which lots and lots of of, of animators have, have since drawn in the lamp of full time uh, the childish element or the childlike element to these characters was was really important one because I think it connects up to to Disney animation and Mickey Mouse and the neotenized version of of rounded shapes and character design and and everything like that but there's also something really radical in 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 lots of ways about having different species different types of dinosaur that are described as I said as uh, through their physical through their physical attributes uh, ultimately leading to a, a, a climax that is about reuniting with with family or uh, community the role of and this this goes back to some to some writing i think by jack halberstam on sort of community and animated films that often the reason that you have fragmented families that it, is that it allows space for communities friends being family and this is this is an interesting um of how this ties into the characterization of the of the dinosaur species themselves because i think everything you said there applies to the child characters and, and the few adults we see at the start of the film but the the sharp tooth character um is yeah. denied a lot of that that is purely animalistic and it's you know it's yeah. just this this um constant presence you know just ferociously trying to attack the kids at all times and we we discussed this a little bit in in sort of the the popularization of of dinosaurs and their their depiction you know in 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 various media uh we sometimes talk about monsterization and because we have to remember that you know even something like a tyrannosaurus you know this sort of six to eight ton bone crushing 12 Mm -hmm. meter long predator it's just an animal you know it's still it's not a monster in the sense of uh you know it's not it's not dracula it's not you know it's not not something that is that is 
nefarious and evil you know when it eats things it's doing it just to just to stay alive um and yet in films not just land before time but you know very often uh the way this animal in particular is depicted in film is as this sort of unstoppable relentless thing which just chases down our protagonists regardless of of whatever they can do to to escape you know if they get away from it in one scene it will catch up with them later in the film and um yeah so it's 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 just interesting thinking about how the 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 child characters in land before time they have developed personalities you know that we can we can look at them some of them are quite proud some of them are quite nervous etc but that that tyrannosaurus is just a blank slate you know it's just this this uh, big set of teeth that's trying to get the kids even when they even when they wrong foot it and a couple of times in the film we see it fall off cliffs and things and it's still trying to eat the children as it's plunging to its death you know it's it's got this real uh rabidness to it which is which is interesting mm-hmm. Well, I, th- I thank you for making that point, Mark, because it's it's. I've got a whole couple of notes about Sharp Tooth. I think we're I think we're due a in the era of remakes and and reimaginations. <laughs> we're, we're due a a Sharp Tooth uh, prequel, uh, his side of the story, because because again, talking about the politics of it, it struck me as this sort of hilariously uh, obvious but apparently not so obvious contradiction in that it's a story about racial harmony but the only way these people can find racial harmony is by demonising um, another species at the expense of, of their own. So we've got these kind of characters coming together to defeat the monster um, of, of Shark Tooth. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I saw it from his perspective a little bit this time. I, 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 maybe I wanted to, you know, um, uh, maybe that speaks more of me than, 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 than of, of Shark Tooth itself. But I, but I wondered what, what the historical basis of that is. I mean, what, when did the T-Rex, or is it just the T-Rex that gets, um, as you say, kind of made into a monster? in popular culture and if it is when did that happen yeah so this is an interesting question um i mean it's it's not something that's just restricted to tyrannosaurus it's basically any large predatory extinct animal and again you can go right the way back to uh i don't know the early 1800s and you get that so the the very first depictions of fossil animals they they um they're they're almost sort of biblical in their representation in that this is a anti-diluvian world you know so before man, uh, this is the dark times before the more enlightened modern times where we have humans and mammals around. So this this kind of ancient Saurian dominated world was frequently depicted as nightmarish and monstrous. And so there are there's no end of pictures of uh, it started out, you know, because it hadn't been discovered yet. This started out with marine reptiles rather than dinosaurs themselves. But are just frequently pictures of these things, you know, ripping each, other, ripping each other's throats out and, you know, always fighting, always battling each other. And dinosaurs get in on that pretty early as well. Once they're discovered, it doesn't take very long before you have pictures of dinosaurs also fighting with each other and wrestling with each other. Um, and so, you know, again, the seeds for that are, are really, you know, just deep planted into, into dinosaur culture. And I think in films, it's probably not quite as exaggerated in, the stop motion era of dinosaur films. Uh, and I, I think a lot of that might just be because of the limitations of the effects. You know, if you look at, um, look at a Ray Harryhausen stop motion dinosaur when it's menacing someone, it tends to run up to the people and then it will menace them from above, you know, kind of roar at them and snap at them um, before you then go to the more complicated shot of maybe it then actually picking someone up. And I think this is just because it's, you know, it's just more difficult when you're working with stop motion to have people interacting directly with the with the stop motion puppets, um, with the uh, with the invention of CGI and you know the the, the uh, adoption of dinosaurs into that form of visual effects, they have become a lot more ferocious and menacing. And now we have animals like uh, Tyrannosaurus and and Spinosaurus and really any big predatory thing, Mosasaurus in the, the in Jurassic World. These things are now able to do whatever they want. So this that they've 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 taken this idea of monsterization to the nth degree to the point where even there's there's an interesting conversation to be had about uh we've, we've touched on this already but there, there's an interesting conversation about how much of the actual science you put into your film depiction of these animals but very often where the science get it gets ignored the most is anything which will um, you know, go against that monsterized depiction. So anything that makes the makes a Tyrannosaurus seem less ferocious will be removed. And there's lots of good examples of that in um, in things like Jurassic Park, for instance. There have been modifications to that animal, uh, to that Tyrannosaurus, so it doesn't so it looks quicker and, and leaner 
and and more ferocious than it than it actually did. I think exactly what you say is very you know this is borne out in even something like the Good Dinosaur, which which play which uses distinctions between species to play with nature versus culture which of course is is central to anthropomorphic representation anyway and and we've talked in previous episodes about that kind of push-pull relationship between the animalistic and the humanistic and 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 how animators play with play with the tension between those two two things i don't think it's any surprise that gertie the dinosaur has been positioned historically as at the at the moment where early animation's kind of trick effects if you like in the short lightning sketch cartoons of the early 1910s gave way to what Paul Wells calls personality animation suddenly at the hands of animators like Windsor McKay thanks to to Gertie the dinosaur the dinosaur was one of the first animated characters and was one of the first characters in animation to hold personality and then and then since then, and, and this struck me about Land Before Time, because of its... I think early on, there's not much dialogue, actually. A lot of things happen visually, and that really shone the spotlight on uh, the kind of cuteness, I guess, the aesthetics of cuteness, uh, and the kinds of performances that that each dinosaur character enables. And so I, I it's interesting what you say about the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the, and the progressive monstrosity of that as a particular character with regards to the other dinosaurs in the land before time are they are there sort of um what's the way are there there deliberate attempts to try and tap into an imaginary of what that dinosaur is like yeah i i I think so and i think um there's, there's a similar approach taken to all of the child characters in the land before time um, not so much to the adults. Uh, the, right. the adults, the, the adults are pretty. They're not. They're actually pretty good. Sort of, uh, you know, obviously stylized and, and cartoonified, but they're actually pretty good representations of what those dinosaurs are meant to look like. There's even some cool little details, like the um, the adult Triceratops. You can see that they've only given it teeth along its cheeks, which is great because they don't have teeth at the front. They've got a beak. So little things like mm-hmm. that are pretty good. But the kids, um, the children, are really interesting because they they've been. Um, quite strongly mammalified, for want of a better better term. <laughs> um, so they, they've moved them away from that reptilian appearance. So they've got very mammal-like proportions. So so real dinosaur babies, um, they they're they're uh, quite what we call quite precocial. So they're they're able to look after themselves most of the time. They're able to walk, you know, very early on, and so they look like little miniature versions of the adults. So like a baby Tyrannosaurus, for instance or a baby Tyrannosaurid, I should say, they're really leggy little things. They're, they're not like kind of cute, dumpy, mammal-like babies with podgy limbs and you know, big heads and stuff. They've got long legs, um, you know, skinny little bodies. Um, so they, they, they look they look like, uh, you know, they look, look, look more capable of looking after themselves. Whereas the, 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 the children in Land Before Time, they are sort of, you know, they've got that stereotypical mammal-like baby appearance where they are, and and specifically, more human, you know, because you think there are some mammal children, things like um, baby horses, baby deer and stuff. They're they're quite quite leggy animals, uh, you know, that that are sort of like miniature versions of their parents. But baby humans are just like these little amorphous bulls, aren't they? They're they're (laughs) really, really pudgy little things. And they've done the same thing in The Land Before Time. Um, it's not, and it's not only their general appearance, it's also things like their faces. So all the children have little rosy cheeks. I hadn't noticed that before, but they've got, at times they've actually got, you know, specifically little bits of red on there to make them look, you know, when they're smiling and things to, to bring out that, that mammal-like quality. They even have little ears. They've got, they're very small so that they're not especially noticeable, but they have obvious external ears on the side of their heads, uh, which reptiles just don't have. Um, also the, the, their, their behavior. So this, the, the um, and this does bring the, the the adults back into it. The the relationships between the adults and the offspring is extremely mammal like, which again we just don't think is is what what dinosaurs are actually doing. But things like um, Littlefoot's mother licks him, you know, when he's first born, and this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's it's it all plays into this this idea of, of of helping us relate to them, even though they look very different. Um, and it's, it's interesting how they, they managed to apply that same, those same sort of mammal-like facial qualities across very different looking animals. So you've got uh, Littlefoot is a, I think he's meant to be a, a, a classic kind of brontosaurus. You've got Sarah the Triceratops. Um, you've got Ducky, which is a, what we call a duck-billed dinosaur. 
or a hadrosaur to give it its technical name. And they all have these very different looking faces and, and body shapes, but they've all been put through that same anthropomorphizing sort of system so that we can relate to them a lot more. And again, we can compare that to the um, the outlier here, which is the sharp tooth, which doesn't have any of these features. It doesn't have little rosy cheeks. It doesn't have those little ears. Yeah. And do, do, do the characters at all play on any kind of, I don't know, cultural stereotypes we might have about the personality of these creatures? I was struck, for example, that, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm reading on my own imaginary kind of relationship with dinosaurs rather than any kind of collective understanding. But like the Triceratops is is in, you know, the glib appreciation of dinosaur art I've got is very often depicted as a kind of warrior. Uh, you know, it, it's often the, the Triceratops battling the sort of Tyrannosaurus Rex or whatever, almost the shield versus the sword. And, and, and Sarah's character is very much this kind of, you know, she almost could like, you know, in, in a historical movie, she could be from Sparta. She's like this, you know, raised amongst this warrior class and she's taught to be strong and and and, and solidary and, and, and you know, kind of masculine almost. And, and that kind of slowly gets broken down in quite a lovely scene where they're kind of all sleeping at night together, cuddled up because it's a bit cold and she has to sort of eventually her stubbornness um, kicks in or, 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 or wanes and she she crawls in and, and kind of gets in this kind of bundle with, with all the kids. Um, is there any and, and we've got Petrie who's you know trying to learn to fly and that's a real sort of important plot point or you've got Spike this kind of basically a cross between a sort of cow and a dog right Chris you can add dinosaurs to things in animation that are often actually dogs even though they're not they're not depicted as such along with horses um is there any other of that kind of I mean do do people have these kind of characters in mind as well as we do with things like the T-Rex or the tri or the um uh Triceratops yeah, this is, this is an interesting question. Um, I think the the thing that's, that struck me, actually, is in, how in some cases they don't conform to those expectations. Yeah. So things like the um, Littlefoot is, you know, as I say, probably a brontosaurus. And these these are animals which are known for having pretty small heads for their body size because they've got, you know, uh, such long necks. They only, only have little heads on the end of them to, to mean that they can still support them. And, um, yeah, you know, small heads go with small brains and therefore they're not necessarily thought to be the you know the, the the smartest dinosaurs in yeah. the of, of the group sarah even says that one... at one point sorry about yes. sarah yeah, even says that she says um you you know you little you you long necks have only got tiny brains or whatever yeah yeah indeed so they actually draw attention to that fact don't they and, and um yeah so so that is a bit of a, a subversion maybe of cultural expectation um uh, petrie the pterosaur behaves very much like uh, many pterosaurs have done uh pterosaurs are often used as sort of comic relief in in um certainly in, in dinosaur cartoons because the the, the 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 prevailing opinion of pterosaurs in in for much of the 20th century is that they were not particularly good flyers and they were sort of awkward ungainly animals and so i, I think the fact he can't fly really kind of ties into that um although it, they, they they also show other pterosaurs at the start of the film which are uh, really quite elegant and 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 quite nicely designed little creatures because Petrie himself is he's a little bit ugly, isn't he? Is 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 what what the kids might call fugly, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so he's he's got this kind of awkward gangliness to him. But they they have other pterosaurs which are really quite cute and um, and they're all very skilled flyers. So again, you know, pick and choose the science that you want to to suit your scene. When you want to do a scene of cute little pterosaurs playing with berries, then yeah, they can fly around like little butterflies, but yeah, when you you know for your your main character, ignore that 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 sequence and just go for the fact he's he's still struggling to fly and um, mm. you know, so yeah, it, it's 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 um a little little bit of, of of both really, a little bit of conforming to expectation and and also not. I guess I guess Spike the Stegosaur is maybe the the real um. The, the, the most character, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he's the most typical of what you'd expect of a, of a dinosaur because Stegosaurus is, is the animal that all the kids' books say has got a brain the size of a walnut. So the fact that mm -hmm. Spike is, is just this you know, kind of slow-moving, mm -hmm. food-obsessed, uh, you know, slightly dim-witted individual, that's almost certainly playing on that trope. So I have two, I suppose, well, I have three. One, I was thinking about what you're saying about anthropomorphism as a system and, and, and how that's really embedded in the representation of the dinosaurs in, in this film. And I do think it comes from uh, the the nature of the film that 
doesn't rely on dialogue too heavily early on um, and there are a lot of, of sort of sequences that are just about the physicality of the of the dinosaurs but i also think it's it's connected to to the journey to the journey narrative because it's only this film is only an hour and hour and kind of five minutes i think and it's maybe 10 and it's and it's it's all about movement and it's all about this journey to the to the great valley and i was thinking about writing on animated narratives and how this is a really economical economical film a lot of animated narratives are carefully unified if we think narratives motivated by clearly defined goal oriented characters um, but there are some there's some interesting twists with regards to, to the use of flashbacks and 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 particularly at the end where they sort of reimagine. Am I right in thinking they sort of reimagine themselves as children again, or they reimagine themselves with flash? There are some flashback sequences. Have I got that wrong? There's there's a line in the end of the voiceover that's something like, and they live there, and their children live there. Right. And there's a certain right, right. ambiguity about whether what we're watching right. now is sort of their. Ch- You're right. There is a sort of. I guess it's that timelessness of it of it all that that it kind of tries to play with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the land before timelessness. So there's but there's something because I, I felt that the film could be very easily divided into sort of seven minute cartoons, the sort of seven minute Looney Tunes chase sequences that you could stitch them all together and, and come to a film of about 70 minutes. Um, and what I liked about it was that it, it, it was quite segmented and there were lots of different moments of action and different, different set pieces and, and, and animation and, and narrative have always, as I said at the start, not all, not all animation has has narrative and not all animation chooses to tell stories but narrative is often one of the things that animation scholars use to sort of make discriminations about experimental animation versus orth- more orthodox animation of which this is very very much an example it's it employs a disney hyper realist uh, aesthetic insofar as characters and, and behavior and movement and action and narrative are all you know quote unquote authentic and realistic and, and, and credible um and what this film is, and because it anchors anchors its narrative onto the idea of a journey, I also think it's 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 connected to to the role of journeys in storytelling, but also back again to this issue of children, um, because if we think about children and their proclivity for exploration and and discovery, what the film cleverly does is that it it sets up a discussion of characters or a discussion between characters that are rooted in childhood as i said long necks and 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 three horns and and ways of describing other dinosaurs based on how they look and then attaches all of that to a narrative about of about discovery um and socialization and 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 meeting people along the way and bringing them into your family and becoming one of the one of the gang and one of the final lines is we did it you know we did it we did it together um and so there's something there's something in really interesting about the the role of of children and but also the representation of children in or childlike characters in the film and then also how the journey narrative is is i think very very much part of that as children discover themselves their boundaries their own bodies um climbing up the walls all these all the ways that we describe children and in, and in, in socialization through through movement and journeys and, and discovery and everything fantasy films like this based on journey narratives, based on, I mean, let's call it an alternative world because we, you know, yes. although although it's historicized to a degree, we've just, uh, Mark's really helpfully sort of set up all the ways in which this is really an imagined world. Uh, they rely on, and I make this point in my book, which is available uh, now, Encountering the Impossible, the Fantastic in Hollywood Fantasy Cinema. There's the plug shameless. in there. Shameless, that, that um, is shameless. Uh, yeah. We'll uh, cut that. Uh, I make this point that fantasies that are set in alternative worlds, particularly fantasies on screen, often rely on a kind of imaginary logic of, as you say, discovery, a childlike logic of fantasy based on exploring new spaces. And this goes right back to sort of early childhood relationships with space um, and and psychoanalysts like... um, Trevor um, Pav- uh, Pateman talk about this, um, where, where when children are discovering spaces, they imagine the space as having some kind of emotional quality, and that helps them appreciate the vastness and the kind of you know objective characteristic of the space. So whether that be um, a scary closet, um, uh, a bewildering neighbor's room that smells a bit funny, um, all the things that kind of children have quite an emotional relationship to space in the way that adults kind of 
you know, by encountering space over and over again, by space not being or becoming familiar, it becomes an imagined objective quality. Um, quality, and this film is is full of that kind of logic. I mean, it goes to a scene where Ducky is doing the um, you know, the the childhood game, "Don't step on the crack or you'll fall and break your back." In mm-hmm. many ways, that scene is a metaphor for the a kind of imaginative delight that films like this encourage, particularly in young children, in that they're all about discovering new spaces that are at first and foremost emotional spaces rather than geographical spaces. We, we have this kind of vague map that we're going to get to the, the Great Valley, but, but every space that matters in this world only matters because of, of its emotional kind of um, effective quality. Um, and, and I think that applies to the story but it also applies to the depiction of dinosaurs in that one of the things that i love about don bluth's movies uh, and we haven't talked about don bluth as much as perhaps we could have but hey there are other films we'll get to him is that he has this kind of nuance of world building about him that i don't think you know previous popular american animations do and that there's always something quite palatable beyond the frame and the, the final kind of dinosaurs i wanted to talk about are those ones that sort of just pop up here and there there's quite often a scene that will begin with a kind of almost silent ice age scrat-esque short <laughs> where some dinosaurs are you yeah. know are, are going about <clears throat> their business and then the children will enter into this world and there's this sense that there is always life that is going on beyond the frame and that this life is is participating in the world on screen. I mean, it's very it's very Lion King. And there's even a line where one of the <laughs> characters say, we're all connected to the great circle of life. And so, you know, gone bluth may sue, but I'm just very interested in that kind of nuance of world building and how that adds to the texture of all these different dinosaurs. I don't know if, if, that, if you noticed that at all, Mark, or if that struck you at all, but there are lots of scenes where kind of we get supporting players of dinosaur activity that will come in. It'll either be, you know, um, a mother looking after their young or some kind of hunting activity or just something that has sets that there is activity beyond the frame at all. Yeah, indeed, I, I clock that. I mean, this is this is particularly the case in the the opening scenes of the film, isn't it? Mm. Where we we begin, and I, I was struck that the the film opens underwater, which feels like a slightly odd place for this film to begin, given that sure. it is set, you know, in a uh, primarily you know terrestrial environment. Uh, and but I think part of that is, is not only building the world, but there's something about the concepts of of ancient life and deep time where things always begin in the water. See, obviously that's where life develops on earth. It's, it's in water. And I think the film is probably trying to, is, is, is playing on that. You know, we, so we go from the, the initial shots underwater. I think there's just one, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what it's meant to be, to be honest. It's, it looks like a kind of generically prehistoric reptile swimming through the water. Uh, you just put some fins on the back of something. It looks like it's prehistoric. <laughs> that's the that's the that's sure, the trick. Sure. Easy. <laughs> yeah. I think Land Before Time does that several times. It throws a couple of things in there, and it's just like, yeah, it's got a fin on the back. It's it's prehistoric. Um, so um, yeah, it starts out relatively simple, and it just becomes more and more complex uh, as we go through. So there's there's this sort of almost parallel to um, sort of the, the the idea of how life itself develops on Earth. It starts in water, and then we eventually emerge up onto up onto land, where we see all these spectacular dinosaurs and there's this there's this terrific sense of as you say the kind of the richness of the world these these animals are meant to live in and i get i guess for if you're watching this film you know without knowing the the rest of the story um they use this to also establish the relationships of the children to their parents uh you know a lot of that interaction is with our our main characters you know meeting their parents and interacting with them um but also that they 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 get the sense of a little bit of danger. There's a, there's an ostrich dinosaur that comes in at one point, or what we call an ornithomimosaur, comes in to try and steal Littlefoot's egg, um, and of course, there's a whole that that then leads to Littlefoot himself hatching. But little things like that, you know, they, they, as you say, they really do bring a sense of 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 the world in to um, into perspective, and and the fact that they are then absent from the 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 sort of the the rest of the film almost. We don't see many other animals. Once the once the journey begins, once we have the the what, what I like to call the kind of the hypergeology, you know, where you don't just have an earthquake that splits the the um, the, the kids from their parents, but it's this enormous, great big, um, you know, this enormous cliff forms in the middle of nowhere, which they 
I like that, you know, continental drift is something where continents move like an inch or two every year. But in this film, because everything's turned up to 11, because uh, it's a prehistoric animal film, you know, geolo geological movements are taking place, you know, uh, thousands of times that, that, that speed. So um, once, we, once we have that, once we have everyone separated, the absence of those other kind of bit player characters, it establishes the fact that children are on their own. You know, even the mm. things that were trying to eat them at one point, we don't see many things other than the sharp tooth after the kids. There are, there is the odd thing here and there, but it, it establishes that sense of loneliness and that they have mm. to, they have to get through this difficult environment without help from anyone. Well, this is the um, this sorry, this is the plot of. Um, it's meant, funny you mentioned Continental Drift because that is the subtitle of one of the Ice Age films, and the and the plot of that Ice Age film, Continental Drift, is very similar to this. It's about the separation between father and son. I think in this case, it's a woolly mammoth because of these shifting these shifting plates, um, and it means that that father and daughter actually, I think, are, are separated, and that precipitates the journey narrative about okay we are now distanced from our parents and we now need to we are now on our own and i'll bandy together with this you know raccoon and this sloth and we will make it and all this sort of stuff so it's interesting that the that the world itself there's a really close relationship between the fictional world and the and the characters um that it seems from what you were saying alex are quite germane to to certain kinds of fantasy films and the way that children ascribe spaces with with their own fears or they map their fears onto these spaces and they anthropomorphize the space and in, in some ways and, and and give it a give it a sentience um but yeah i mean i i really liked the land before time and and and, and actually appreciated its economy of storytelling the fact that you had these this this rich fictional world but that it, it wasn't it was still kind of very character centered, which I really liked. Um, and yeah, that economy of storytelling stretched over just over an hour, mapped quite simply onto these series of, of, of vignettes, but that allows a, a close exploration on collaboration between characters, tension between characters and, and harmony that lead to this, lead to this really kind of colorful, colorful endpoint. So um, yeah, I think there's lots to say about, about Bluth and, and he does get a little bit forgotten, as you mentioned, with regards to, to sort of the, his precise way of, of building worlds. So I think there's definitely a, a yeah, an article or, or probably a book on, on his contribution to, to American animation. That's kind of still going strong, really. And indeed, plenty more podcasts. Um, yeah. Mark, thank, I think we've reached the Great Valley now. Um, so uh, it's probably <laughs> nice. time to rest and eat whatever it is they're eating. It looks just to be leaves to me. But hey, uh, I'm supposed to be on a diet anyway, so that's good. Uh, Mark, um, is there anything you can tease our listeners with as to what's coming up? Do you have any scientific research projects that um, people can access or any consultancy work you can um, highlight for them? At, and how could they find you? on the world of the internet if they so wish to kind of see more of what you are what you're doing i'm quite i'm quite easily found online so i um i mean i guess best places to to follow me if, you, if you'd like to see what i'm up to uh i'm on twitter just under at mark witten uh i also blog uh at the the mark .com blog um if, if you'd like to see some of my my artwork and things it, a lot of it is online at, the, at those venues or if not um i have several books which are all illustrated by myself uh the most recent one of which is called life through the ages 2 which uh, came out a couple of years ago now uh and this is a um one of these classic books of, of just going through the history of life from the very first you know microbes all the way up to uh up to the modern day and um, I have another book coming out next year, which I can't tell you what the title is yet, but um, look for that out next May. Uh, it's something, if you're into the history of, uh, of dinosaur art and of, of paleo art, then it's, it's something that will really be of interest. Um, I can also tease, but I can't tell you anything about. Uh, so we mentioned that I've done some consultancy work. So uh, there's going to be a really cool, uh, really cool uh, animation project coming out, I think, next year. Uh, but I can't do anything more about that. But I'm really looking forward to it, and um, I, it'll be something that when it when it comes out, uh, it should be a pretty big deal. And um, yeah, when, when when you see that big dinosaur project, go hmm, might might have been teased about that here first. Amazing, you <laughs> heard it. Here I am first. Yeah. I am suitably teased. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that sounds great. And I uh, I do I encourage you to listen to check out Mark's work because it's it's really great. Um, Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been really fun talking dinosaurs with you. 
Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I, I think what, what's, what's terrific about a film like Land Before Time is that it, there's actually just so much going on under the under the bonnet, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, to look at it, it's like a outwardly, it's a short, simple kids film, but actually, there's just so much going on there. Uh, with, with you know, as we've been saying, you know, all, all these different cultural and, and scientific aspects. So this has been terrific to, to talk about. Thanks very much. A, a ditto sentiments. Um, you can, of course, find us uh, via the website at fantasy-animation.org and read our latest blog posts as well as access our archive of podcasts. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at fananimresearch, F-A-N-A-N-I-M uh, research. Um, and if you want to contribute to the blog, we always look for... Um, uh, contributors for whether you're a researcher a fan uh, an animator out there um, get in contact via the website we'd be delighted to hear from you or indeed our email address fan and in research at gmail.com uh, that's us for another week uh, and we will see you next time Don't Bye. Lose your way.